people put something in their mouth and then we'll be glad to start the shmooze. Okay. Yeah. Now you're okay with what's happening? We're good? Sure. Are you going to have to finish it for a lot of longer? Uh, I can't drink wine. Do you have different for the I have different sizes. Teach us Yiddish. Yeah. You know, you, you know how many you know, we used to be when I used to go to camp with good old Abbotton? Shabbat all the I don't I know but there's some some wonderful old timers let me see one thing from Moyes Sur that Papa was saying all of us was from the blues of us. Uh, <laughs> This was a thing you could sit in front of the candles and keep looking at them with it. So, you're the the Moed uh, Asr. What is your read on Regal? Mezoinus or not? I think it's a Mozi person. I think it's a Mozi person. You think it's a Mozi, so then people have to watch. It's <laughs> good. <laughs> 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 okay, so whoever wants a bagel, go and wash. Okay, I'm going to wait for the shahakal of this. <laughs> Unless you're Sephardic. If you're a Sephardic person, you might not need to wash. <laughs> what's, what's nice about the reason why the, there's a whole geschäft about, uh, the reason why you say make hamosi is because of a suffix, because it is boiled. Um, and if it is boiled, some people say mazoinus is okay, and you don't have to wash. So, yeah. but you're the mother of the Asa, and you say, wash, so go wash. <laughs> by default, I'm the mother of the Asa. I said, by default, I'm the mother of the Asa. No, 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 you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's called default? Uh, I think when there is a, uh, a program on the computer, and you install it, you want to the, the, the default, you know, that's the regular. The default is the regular. <laughs> There are other mazonas. These are homemade, organic, mostly organic. Uh, I'm interested in that homemade, organic, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> spelt. It's even spelt. It's <laughs> yeah, spelt flour. That's a mazonas. So we'll call this. Just I'll bring them stuff. around this way. Yes, I'll bring them around. I'm, I'm interested in that one. He's doing this one. <laughs> White flour, oil, and eggs. Great. <laughs> and it's don't worry, it's not it's pesticides. <laughs> <laughs> Question about meat sauce. Top of the honeycomb. Irish. Irish mum and love these are making their way this way. This way? Um, oh, it's, oh, it's healthy. It's the forks. I'll pass the forks down there. I'll start working on the back. And the cake. And the cake. The balance. Hi. Yes, somebody said something. I was so proud of you. 
Did you say something? Yes, thank you. Not out loud. Okay. 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 Amar So guys, I'm about to light the Hanukkah candles right now. Right now. Right so now. should we just have a kavana in mind that this be a refuah for Steve Phillips mm. and um, anybody else who needs healing? Mm. David Zeller. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, some kind of blood disease or something? Oh my God. Who does? David Zeller. What's his name in Hebrew? You know, David. No, I mean, I mean, um, Steve. Chaim Yaakov Ben Rizal. And David Dillard's Rafael, David Ben something, like Linda. Ben something? Ben <laughs> something. Sorry. There's also a woman at the JCC who had an investor in secretary of the JCC, Kavar Bastian Bennett. So I'm going to light, so I'm going to have in mind everybody else's mind while I'm lighting. Um, 
So, and thank you for the honor. And sh should we put it in the window? Or? No, no, it's through the thing. Ruchata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher kishanu b'mitzvotav V'tzivanu lehadlik neshel hanukah Amen Ruchata Sani sim la votenu Bayamim bazman ha Asani sim la votenu Bayamim ha hem bazman ha zet I got lost in the niggin The oil, the oil Yes, you So here we start. Right. The donuts are arrived. And Noah, the ocean shines. Yeah, all of it. That's right. The Homa Sefa. The same for the donuts. The donuts. Yeah, you want this? Yeah. Make sure we have it. Uh, she wants the. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to keep saying that. When you record everything, it's uh, <laughs> All right. We want to just find out uh, where and how we met each other. What did you remember? I know exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I can claim. In the moment, I don't remember anymore. No, no. It was 1958. Uh-huh. Okay. And it was an Irish And my teacher was Robert Rosenfeld. Oh, that Charlie Schutters. No, it was, uh, might have been a Charlie Schutters as well, but how I met you yeah. is I walked into the base of the Medrash in Barassa, the Yeshiva, Mary Sharam. Yeah. And there was a man that looked very, very religious, and he had a beard and the whole thing. And Sitting there, I was actually standing there, when Lachita Moran, and I think he was learning Boel Taro. That's right. And uh, <laughs> and he starts up with my teacher asking questions. <laughs> my teacher answered that. And before you know it, they were going from what was written on the page to half of Shas, everything in there, this and this, and this toast was, and this Rashi, and this. And, uh, and anyway, my teacher answered all his questions. At least he seemed satisfied. <laughs> and um, I had nothing to say. I was, uh, you know, just listening. Didn't understand half of what was going on at the time. <laughs> and my teacher walked out and he said, um, I know how to learn. And that I was mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so was the I was so, so surprised because you come into the Brasva Shul, in those days at least, you know, what you saw was the opposite of other shuls, other Hasidic Shtiba. There, everybody had, if you come to Ger, everybody has a spot. <coughs> if you come to, to Revalis, everybody has those striped capotes and the little white yarmikas with the chip chicken top. <laughs> you come into Braslav and you see everybody is his own person. They have their own. And there sits a young man, um, clean shaved, <coughs> and he is teaching the Kutamaran. And I was surprised by that, <laughs> yeah, to, to see that they are all listening to him. And so what more can you tell us about Rosen, Rosenfeld, yes? Yeah, well, he was, um, Reb Nachman in his time said that uh, I only used the Zechut Avot, I only prayed to God using the merit of my ancestors several times, not very often. One of the times was to bring Rav Aaron the Rav to Breslov, and eventually that happened. There was this very great posting, his name was Rav Aaron. And he came to Breslov and eventually became a student of Rabbi Nachman. And officially, he was the Rav of Breslov. He passed all the Shilas, 
And uh, he became a very big part of Rabbi Nachman. My teacher was straight lineage from the Rav and the Rav of Breslau, uh -huh. which also includes the Sharina Rav, who mm -hmm. married into the family of Rav Nossen, and uh, Rav Ram Sternhaus, who was the Rav of Rav Gidal Yekenig, and oh, yeah, yeah, the other time, right. And, uh, and he was also in the Gidal Yekenig's Rav, my teacher's Rav, Rav Ram Sternhaus. I actually passed away before I came to his Rav of years. So uh, he came from a long lineage of Rav Ram, and he had a he didn't have a photographic memory, but he had a tremendous big key. He's a person who, sometimes you get a person who all he does is learn Gemara. And, okay, but he doesn't know anything about the Midrash. He certainly doesn't know anything about the Zohar. My teacher, no matter what you hit him on, it didn't matter if it was the Zohar, or the, the Halach, whatever it was, he didn't know it by heart, but he could literally tell you every page. It was a normal page. He could tell you what Sif and Shulchan are, which page in the Zohar, exactly which page in the Talmud, or which Tos was. And uh, he had uh, that kind of a mind. He was very, very smart. And yet at the same time, though he was brought, in, brought up in Russia, uh, when he, he was born in Russia, he was brought up basically in Brownsville, in New York, when he was in Berlin. And um, so he was, uh, for all intent and purpose, uh, pretty much of a, an American type person. And he didn't uh, have a beard uh, until maybe about uh, 10 years before he passed away, he finally put on a beard. <laughs> but you could see him and you wouldn't expect that he had that kind of knowledge. Uh, Ramosha Feinstein once said about him that uh, the Torah is uh, the Torah sort of lies in the corner and nobody notices him. He says, this guy's a good example of that. <clears throat> and you, was it you that were, had a Zion area named after him? Was that your? No, no, no. He had a lot of time. Well, we, the, when you ask me what kind of a topic do I want to have the conversation on, so, I feel very strongly about this topic, that's why I suggested it. When you look at most um, philosophers, Jewish philosophers, they all want to come to the point to say that God doesn't need anything from us. And um, if you're righteous, what do you give to him? I could go to him and so on and so forth to say that the Rebbeinu doesn't need anything from us and that everything that's in creation is given for our benefit and as Rabbi Nachman starts this wonderful conversation saying Rebbeinu felt so much Rachmanis but there wasn't anyone on whom to give us Rachmanis so he created the world so there should be some people on whom to give, show the Rachmanis <laughs> that's a funny one because that already creates a need in Hashem Yisrael to show the Rachmanis. Okay. But if you go with the Rambam, you go with all the other people, they say, God is impassable, no matter what we do. You know, it doesn't make a, a motion. On the other hand, you have some people who come and say that God has needs. And one of the ways in which that gets explained goes with a possible. What does the Lord your God ask of you? That you should fear Him. So, there's this whole wonderful geshift about uh, first the Gemara saying, hey, come on, is that such a simple thing? That, that to fear God, that we have to work on that? And says, so, the Moshe, according to the, you know, the Moshe was saying this, for him it was a simple thing. So then they ask, but show him if you know, he's asking it from you, he's not asking it from other people. So then Rav Shnei Zalman comes up and says that we all have in our, in our heart, in, in ourselves, a shtikl Moshe Rabbeinu. And if you get in touch with that aspect of Moshe Rabbeinu inside of yourself, then yir is a simple thing. On top of this comes the following. If the Rebbein Shalom has everything, what do you give to someone who has everything? <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing the Rebbein Shalom doesn't have. He doesn't have the experience of Yiras Hashem. <laughs> God doesn't need anything, so, so how would God know what it is to feel? 
So Ma Hashem Lekech Shoyu like borrows. What does God need to borrow from us? Is to see what does it feel like when we stand in awe before God. And that the Rabbi Shalom doesn't have and for that he needs us. That's one simple thing. And then there is more teaching that tells <coughs> to say that whatever we do is Tzorach Gavoa. For the sake, we're doing it for God's sake and not for our sake. So al tiyuk kavodem am sham shem esarav al manas v'kavu pras. Don't do your mitzvahs for the sake that you want to have a big shtick of yosin in elam habit. But um, do it, do it for the rabbi And then it says again that you should have that yirat shemayim on top of that. So that comes right back to this, to this issue. One more point I want to make, and that has to do with the issue of Shechina. Whenever we would uh, think, you, you look in Chassidosh Hesporim, they say everything that we are doing is a shame Yerud Kutshvei Yerud and to lift up the Shechina from where she is. And if you see, what does it mean Shechina? Shechina means that part of Hashem that is Memalek Almin fills the world, and fills this world, and is not at home in this world. That's to say, the Rebbe supports everything, including the person who is, a, who is a sinner, including the person who is violent, and so on and so forth, and supports that person. So, but what does it do to the Rebbe It sort of puts it, Rabbi Shneir Zalman puts it at one point, it's like taking the king's head and putting it into the toilet. <laughs> So the Shechina is constantly in, in exile, and for this we would wake up in the middle of the night. So what we are doing is for the sake of the Shechina. So it's not that Kutsche Bericha needs it, but the Shechina needs it. And whatever we do, we have to help for the Shechina. So that's the issue of the, that I would like to have more Shmusen about, because most of us don't have the sense that what we are doing is to help the Shechina get that energy. I would, I would say that I agree with almost everything that Lama said, except I would use a different word to resolve a problem. You don't need to make a problem if you don't need to make one. Instead of asking whether God needs anything, no, I don't think God needs anything. I think God wants certain things. But want is different than need. Okay, in fact, the rabbis begin in saying, when it went up in the will of God to create the world. Creation is a manifestation of God's will, it is not a manifestation of God's essence. And if you think that that contradicts the idea of, you know, a singular, unified God, it doesn't, in a very simple way, you know, I love my coffee in the morning. <laughs> and so I pour the glass of hot water on top of this delicious coffee, I mix in some sugar and evaporated milk because it reminds me of my mother. <laughs> and I really want to drink this glass of coffee. And just before I'm about to drink it, the telephone rings. And it's my best friend in the whole world. And he says, Gedalia, you got to get over here. It's an emergency. So now I don't want to drink the coffee anymore. I want to go over to my friend. So I change what I want. But a change in will doesn't constitute a change in essence. I'm still you know. And the beautiful part of it is that God can make manifest his will, and on the level of will, will can interact, it can change, it creates. And yet, no matter how many times it changes, at any given moment, it's at harmony with God. So for all intent and purpose, God's will and God are the same thing. But if you want to analyze it, does God need anything. The Zohar says not only doesn't he need anything, the concept of will was created by God. He doesn't even have a will. Now, what does that mean? Well, it simply <laughs> means that we have no idea about what God is in essence. We know as much about God as he allows us to know, and we know it in a way through which he made our brains and our, you know, and our emotions to function. So, Yes, God wants certain things, and he doesn't want them because he needs them. He wants them because he wants to give good to us. He wants us to enjoy his good. Okay, that being said, what happens if we don't want to enjoy God or to recognize him? Then God, on the level that he wants to do good, 
is upset. His will isn't being fulfilled. All right? And so, therefore, we can use, you know, anthropomorphic images and say that God cries, and God is upset, that God is this. But what we're talking about is once we posit that his will is in the world for a purpose, if that purpose is defeated or upset or changed in any way, then the will that was bent to serve a purpose is itself disappointed. The knife was used to cut. I created the knife to cut bread, and somebody went and killed somebody with the knife. So if the knife had a conscience of its own, it would be upset that it was used against the purpose for which it was created. On the other level, the, this is the Shekhinah and Golas there, I agree. The Shekhinah is the indwelling presence. The Shochin means to dwell. So you know God's will gives life and sustenance to everything. But that's interesting because the very will that supports this particular form or person or being in the world is now held prisoner by the very thing it's giving life to. It's almost like saying, I have a soul and my soul is now prisoner to my body. And if I want to take that indwelling presence, which is the Shekhinah in myself, and redeem it, then I have to see to it to make sure that my soul and my body are not at odds with each other. If I want to take the indwelling presence that's in a piece of food and redeem it, raise it up, put it in alignment with God, and make a broker over it. Right? So in that way, um, I'm constantly trying to align myself or the things around me with God. I'm trying to return creation to the Creator. That's what I'm trying to do. And, and maybe that's part of the idea of Shabbos. When we rest from creative activity, if we can get a definition of what exactly that means, but assuming we can, when we rest from creative work on Shabbos, then basically we are not interfering or putting our own shape to th God's potentialities, but rather recognizing all potential is a manifestation of God's will. That's, I'm not so sure we're disagreeing, but that's, that's my take on it. I like the way in which you were talking about the knife. By Avraham Avinu it's called Machelet. And later on becomes Sakin, mm -hmm. from Sakone. It is meant to give you food to eat, the knife. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes a murder uh, uh, weapon. And so it changes the name from Machele to Sakin, and that's mm -hmm. very, yeah, that's very, very, very difficult to have to live with. It's like Lechem and Melchama. Hmm? Yeah. Lechem and Melchama. That's right. That's right, and Matzel Mariba. So, so you have all these words that, that go with it. Or for that matter, if we're supposed to fear God, Yira, comes from the word like Yero and to see. To be seen. In other words, what are we afraid of? What we can't see because we can't control it. Well, I like it. I like to say Yira stands for a reflexive. For instance, spect. I inspect, I look, Roe. Mm -hmm. And when I have the sense I'm coming into a room, I think I'm alone. And then I look around, and there's someone in the corner. And I didn't notice that a person was in the corner. Then you have right away that startle reflex. And that's what it says in the Shulchan Aruch right at the beginning, you know, if you recognize that you're being seen. And that wonderful mezid, chasko mezid, you know, that, that there's always someone who sees. Uh, but I want to get on to the other part of yes. It's interesting the way you, the different ways that you that you both spoke. Um, you know, Rosalman, yours. I I, I want to be needed. You know, it's it's like a warmer. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know what's you know what's true or false or up or down. But it's like it's like I, I would rather be needed than wanted. You know, Bob Dylan has a line, it's something he says, you know, he, he can give you what you want, but I can give you what you need. Um, what's the song? 
You know, or the stones. You know, you can't always get what you want. But it's, 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 there's something about there's something about being needed, which 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 makes it a warmer, more dynamic relationship. Which is like the want is just sort of like, yeah, you know, you're my cup of coffee, Gabrielle. And if I decide I want to go visit my friend, then sorry, you know, I'll catch up with you later. Um, there's a sense of there's a sense of, of coldness in, in the relationship, which might it might be phenomenologically correct. It just it's just like that that version speaks more to the. To I the, think in the, the end, he's telling her. this thing. He's saying that his friend needs him, and that's the reason why he went to be with his friend, right? right? So the, the word of need, that word need is a very important part. I want to go and say more about that. Okay. When we go and we say, we are really asking the Rabbani to come on, come out of the hiding, become more manifest, and so on and so forth. So then we are given an opportunity to do something that they discuss under the name Binyana Malhut. We are the ones who build the kingdom. And the more we pay tribute, in this word especially, we pay tribute to the king. The more the king's mouth spreads, more people participate in, in, in building the kingdom. When the question comes about how much is the revengeful king over the world today, and you were to ask, measure the consciousness of human beings, how much inner space they allow for that, you see that the kingdom is pretty schwach. <laughs> And if you say that, you know, there's a wonderful expression that somebody adds to the power of the familia of heaven. <coughs> familia, this entry, pamalia, familia. So it comes out like this. Who's the familia? Yud, hey, vav, hey, abba, ima, ben, um, bas. Then in the Rebbe there are those... There's the, the old yang, the old yin, the young yeah. yang, the young yin, you know, <laughs> the young father, mother, son, and daughter. I mean, that, that's how it comes out. And that needs to be strengthened. And so when we do certain things, we strengthen that, we create a field, and we make a deposit in that. And then, when the time comes that we need to draw from there, to bring a bracha out and so on and so forth, when we have made a deposit, and my statement at this point is that I want to put out as a challenge to all of us. That, you know, Hanukkah is here, and we have to add every day a little bit more, because the kingdom of Hashem is at this point very poor in the world. And um, what does the Shalom need? He needs for us to create more and more God space around us. And that's what I see with the issue of Binyan HaMalchut. Now, in some levels, we do this in action. In other levels, we do it in speech. And Lashon Hore, for instance, is a way in which we cut out the kingdom of God, right? And then you get to the place of Machshavit. Where does thought and our thought, our will, when we do mitzvahs, come in to create that space? And I think that's worth discussing more because that gives us the sense of what our contribution is. Who needs you, you know? Yeah. I think that that's right. I think that, you see, if I, if I need anything, even a relationship with God, there's a subtle implication that what I want in the end is whatever it is I feel I need. And so I want God to accommodate my need rather than to lift myself because I want God. I think we have to make a space, like Rav Zalman says, to let God in. But at once the first Rebbe came into a group of other Rabbonim and he sat down and he asked, where's God? Hmm. And they looked at him like he's out of his mind, he's all over, isn't he? And the Kutsky Rebbe said, nah, God is wherever you let him in. In fact, there's a Zohar, there's a, on a verse, Zesh Mili Olam, this is my name forever, and this is my remembrance from generation to generation. So the Zohar points out that if you take the Tetragrammaton, the Yud Kei Vav Kei, so Yud Kei together with the word Shmi equals 
365, which are the low tasses, how many negative commandments there are in the Torah, don't do this and don't do that. If you take the word zikri and you add vavke to it, you have ramach 248, those are the things you're supposed to do. So now comes the great question. Everybody knows that the yudhe is much more ha powerful and much more filled with compassion than the vavke. So how is it that we're equating yudke with the mitzvahs that tell us to stay away from stuff, and the vavke, which is din, with the mitzvahs that tell us go ahead and do it, right? So I'll tell you an interesting story, always bothered me, until I remembered something that once happened to me when I was about uh, 15 years old. And I always hated compulsory learning, and uh, didn't like school at all, never did, though I still don't like school. <laughs> and, um, and especially people start bossing you around, you know. But I went to yeshiva and I was interested in learning, so most of the time when I played hooky it was only from the secular. But after a while, <laughs> even the religious stuff gets on you, you know. So, so, one, <laughs> so one time I decided I needed a day off. So I went to, uh, on a train, I went up to Central Park. It's a beautiful day, it was like in the beginning of June. And I'm walking around like a prince, and I'm thinking of all my fellow students, you know, in those classrooms, listening to those teachers. Ah, I'm out here, I'm walking around, I go to the zoo, I'm looking at the flowers, I go. <laughs> I mean, I'm walking around, and finally I came to this place where there's, there were these chess boards, you know, like in a park, and mm -hmm. there's old people sitting around and playing chess. And I'm watching them for a while, and then right around in that place, there were benches you could sit on. So I sat down on a bench. I'm sitting there just, wow, feeling good about myself. And this old guy who's wearing sort of a little beret walks over and he says, can I sit down on a bench? I said, I don't own the place. Well, take a load off the floor. <laughs> so he sits down and he gets out a bag of, you know, nuts or something and he's feeding pigeons. And after a while he says to me, Shouldn't you be in school? <laughs> <laughs> and I say, I'm playing with you. <laughs> I'm wearing a yarmulke. He says, you play hooky in yeshivas too? <laughs> I say, any kid anywhere who really wants, you know, to learn something, learns it out of school. <laughs> so we get into this conversation. And I ask him after a while, like, what do you play a hooky from? Um, what do you do? Um, he says, me, I'm a sculptor. Sculptor? Yeah, you know what a sculptor is, he's asking me? I say, yeah, that's what Avram Avinu's father was. He made <laughs> <laughs> So, this person is getting into this conversation with me about art and how, you know, the artist does a favor to the world by sculpting or by painting, and in a way, his consciousness, what he sees, can be sort of brought out in you know, it's shared with other people around him. And I say, I'd rather just see the thing itself and come to my own conclusions. And after a while, he's a very nice sort of old man, and he says, you know, I live over there, and he points to three houses around Central Park, very fancy. I live in that building over there. Would you like to come and see some of my sculptures? So I say, you got any things to drink up there? <laughs> <laughs> He says, I can give you Coca-Cola. He says, okay, let's go. <laughs> so he takes me to this house. He takes me to this place. I remember something like he was like, he owned like half a floor in this building. Mm -hmm. Gigantic. And he's showing me, and I'm looking at these things. And um, I'm looking at one sort of big sculpture. And he says, how do you like it? And I said, yeah. He said, you don't know how to look at it. I said, I'm looking right at it. What do you want me to do? <laughs> he says, no, 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 no. He says, you don't look at a sculpture. You look at the space around the sculpture and just see the sculpture from your, the periphery of your view. He goes behind me and says, here, now look at me. And he turns my head and he says, now just look, look around. And all of a sudden, like, boom! All of a sudden, this, this sculpture like almost came alive. Um, uh, and I told him so. And he says, all right, you see, you don't know everything yet. <laughs> and we talk for a while, he gives me his card, he says, you come visit me anytime you want. Mm -hmm. I put it in my wallet and I went home. Name Lipschitz? 
how did you know? <laughs> so, so, so a couple of days later, I'm over at my friend David Charles David Blackman, and I'm telling the story. And his mother says, "Well, what was the man's name?" I said, "I don't remember." I'm take out the car and it's Jack Lipschitz. Who is he? One of the, well, he's too young. Um, he was probably one of the probably the the most famous Jewish sculptor in the last fifty years. Sculptor in the last fifty years. Anyhow. So I come back to the Zohar, and the Zohar says that those mitzvahs that you, you know, that are prohibition, stay away from this. They have, they have, they carry with them the UK, They're the biggest chesed. And I remember hmm. that you know, in order, in order to receive good, in order to have a connection with God. You have to let God in, you have to make a space. Whenever we don't do something we're not permitted to do, so metaphorically we move away from that thing. And in between is a space. And in that space, that's the space for creation. And that's also the space that gives us the objectivity we need to see a thing in all of its beauty. And so basically, to, to serve God is known as Lassus, its own kona, but the be osa its own Hashem. That word osa, lasa, is usually like to do. But really, you know what it also means? It means to make. We make God's will real in the world when we give it form. And we give it form when we do mitzvahs. But in order to do mitzvahs, we have to make a space in ourselves that allows for the doing of a mitzvah, just because God said so, not because I need it. And when, I, when I'm able to do that, then somehow his will is created through my doing. And what I do becomes his will. Two points to add to that. <laughs> One is um, the way that Pia Setzen puts it in Dara Hamela. It says that every mitzvah, the Rabbani Shalom does the mitzvah too. So how could the Rabbani Shalom eat matzah? Mm -hmm. So he says, in our mouth, Hashem mm -hmm. needs matzah. Mm -hmm. you know? So what does the Rabbi Nishom need? He needs it from us. The second point I want to make is how the Magid was talking about that. There's a statement that says, when are we called children and when are we called servants? We are called servants when we don't do the will of God. We are called children when we do the will of God. So the Maggit raised the question, what do you mean, what kind of servants are they if they don't do what God says? <laughs> so he says, you got to understand, Osi means they create in God the will. So the Maggit tells the following mashal for that. It turns out that there's this dignified London father, and he's playing with his kid, <laughs> and his yingle says, Abba, I want to do horsey right. So Papa gets down on the floor, and the kid sits on the top of the, the Papa, and Papa makes like he's playing horse. Along comes Ashena Yi, comes in and sees the Papa on the floor and says, what's this, oh, you're playing a, like a horse on the floor with the kid? He says, my child wanted it. So he says, so, 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 so what if the child wanted it? You have to make yourself so, 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 you don't understand, he says. The way my child wanted it, the, the tickle in his belly was so geschmack that I want it now too. So, masa over similar bonim, you know, that when the Rabban Shalom sees how Avramovino did something, and he's happy, he says, do that for me, you know, that made a will in me. So we participate also in what a mitzvah becomes, when a mitzvah becomes a mitzvah, because we say, we love to shake a lulav, we love to to down, we love to do that. So when it comes to the business of Gemilut Chasadim, it's easy to say. Why? Kiyamud li min evyen. Behold so awesome like so. Anybody suffers, Hashem suffers with that person. So when I go and give money to a poor person, so you have the coin is the yud, and the hand is the a with the five fingers, the giving, you know, becomes the vav, stretching it out. The other hay is the taking. So you see that once again we constitute a divine thing in that. And the Rabban Shalom really is the recipient at the time. 
when I do Milos Kasavim, and that's easy. When I'm learning, it's a different story, and I don't know if you ever had the experience, and it's not easy to do to have that experience with other people around. I used to live in Borough Park on 13th Avenue, 53rd Street. On the bottom, there was a Vesmetosh called the Shavashava Sanchez Fart. We lived on the third floor of that, of that house, and I had a key to the shul. So when I finished my day's work and doing uh, as an operator on the fur geschäft and so on and so forth, I would go down to the Vesmetosh by myself. And I opened up a Gemore, and I remembered how it says, I'm sitting to learn, and the Rabban Shalom is teaching me. And by not having anyone else around at that time, and going into that sp- space, the Rabban Shalom teach me the Shtikul Gemore. There was such an amazing thing at that point. The feeling was very clear. And I feel that at that point I was making space. Uh, there was Binyan HaMalchus. That in the I thou possibility, by making the space for the for Hashem to be the thou vis-a-vis my I, and that's in the learning. So that's also good. The hardest part for making space for God is in the mind. Mm. Mm-hmm. And when people say, for instance, I'm meditating, you know, I find people who are doing Vipassana, and they say, uh, Vipassana which Maltz is Jewish meditation, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and they, they're, they're sitting there, and what happens is very often they close themselves off, you know, <laughs> and they go in, and it's not Nochach Pnei Hashem, that in the consciousness that they want to achieve, it isn't transparent to God, it doesn't open up to invite God into that meditation. It wants to do it in their own head. And so I think the issue of creating space, being an amalchus, to make space that the eventual is and and at this point looks into me and my motivation and everything else. It's really open, nothing is hidden at that point. If I can keep that consciousness going, I'm investing at that moment in... Uh, in that. And so, when you look at the way in which, where was the base of the In space. It was destroyed. So the Chachamim said, where is Hashem, where is the base of Mikdash now? The ten days between Rosh and Yom Kippur. Dear Shef Hashem, the Imotso, that's where you find it. And that is, first it was in Oilam, and then it is in Shona, and now it's in Nefesh. And I think the issue of consciousness today as a real issue in everything that we learned from people like the Piyasetzna of Nachman and Chabad and all those, they're trying to tell us something about consciousness. So I want to ask you, what have you learned about this <laughs> issue of consciousness, no Pnei Hashem? I think that um, when it comes to consciousness, then we have an Indian of the called the Malaman and Lokim, the Malaman has man, or in another way of putting it, is a Mua Tamachsik is a Maruba. A little bit that holds more than it should be able to contain. The first time we have that chance is in the Midrash Rabbah. There you have on the words that um, God gathered the waters to one place, you cover the Moa and the Lokim Echon. So the Midrash Rabbah says, wait a minute, the idea is the whole globe is covered with water. Then God says, let this water gather to one place. But that one place is full of water. <laughs> so it's like saying, I got a glass full of water, and all the water in the world is gathered into the glass. It's already full of water. Comes the answer that this place is a Maruba. It's a little bit that can contain more than it should be able to hold. Then in Shash, you have many places that this concept is. One of Baba Basra says that the Oram uh, was Eino Minamida, that the, let's say the, the, or, the place where the, where the Ark was, the Holy of Holies, um, is uh, like 20 by 20. 
and the ark is in the middle. So if you stood on the left side of the ark, you counted to the wall, it would be ten. Stood on the right side, it would be ten. So that means, well, where's the ark? It doesn't take any, it doesn't take up any space. That room is a bua tamachzik yisabarubah. Now, this is a concept you see also in Pirkei Ovos, Omdim Tzfufim, the Ishtachavu, the Ravacha, the people in the temple, they stood in the courtyard, tight, you know, tightly pressed together. It came time to prostrate themselves, and everybody had ample room, and some room in between people. Magic, you know. Supposing I want to find an allegory to that in the human condition, then it's the mind. You can't say that I have so much in my mind, nothing else fits in. It's also the emotion. You can't say, I love somebody that I can't love them or somebody else just a little bit more. So the mind and the emotion are mua tamachsa kisa marupa. Could you tell us now, the now, fifth story of the... I could, but it'd take me very long, yeah, the, and, about the hunchback. Yeah. But, but, but <laughs> I mean, then, then we're here for the rest of the night. Yeah. But, 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 uh, but it's an amazing thing here because that means that as much as we put into our minds, there's infinitely more space we can keep putting in. That means that anything we know, no matter how much we know it, there's room to know some more or a different take on what we already know. Because you got to watch out. Some people have so much, such so, so open minds, their brains fall out. But I don't mean that. <laughs> but, but basically, um, there's always room in the mind for something else. But what we got to watch out for is not to contaminate the space. In the temple, in the holy temple, as you went from place to place, the holiness intensified. This notion of muatam machzik as a maruba was more intense, and you had to be more pure. What does it mean? You had to be pure. The person had to had to be tohor, because that space that is a muatam machzik as a maruba that can hold more than it should be able to contain must be kept pure. It's interesting this word tohor. The Gemara, the Gemara in Chulin, page Samach. Um, a candle in daylight, what good is it? The word for daylight is tihara, which is the same word as tahara, pure. So light, which basically is kind of, it moves, it's in flux, it's, you know, uh, and it, it gives us clarity. It has something to do with being pure. On the other hand, to be metamtem something, to make something impure. That word metamtem is very closely related to the word timtum, which means to stuff up, to make stupid. So, so it's possible to stuff up the clear space in our mind so that the flexibility in the mind isn't there anymore. When does it happen? All right, we're talking about consciousness. So somebody is ill and a doctor comes in and says, uh, you got six months to live. The person says, well, he went to medical school for eight years. Seems like a bright guy, probably knows what he's talking about. Hmm. Okay, and as soon as you believe him, that you got eight months to live, you probably will live for eight months. Because, because we can be so frightened by something we think we know that it brings the flexibility of the mind, the fluidity of the mind to a grinding halt. And at that point, we become impure. And there's no room for hope and there's no clarity enough to see God. And Rabbi Nachman said about God, by God is Amos Meglech. God can do anything. Now, obviously everybody's got to check out one time or another. And that we, you know, it doesn't, but, but many people who are ill, maybe they really have to die, or maybe if they have the right attitude, they can do something to remedy their situation. It's also an interesting thing, I was talking about this with somebody last night, that we have to always say yes. In other words, it's a, it's an inter it's a paradox. On the one hand, I gotta, if a person is ill, they have to take their medicine, they gotta do their exercise, they gotta pray to God real strong. I wanna, I wanna remain alive. On the other hand, if you interview cancer patients who have beaten cancer, you just sit them down and have a cup of coffee, tell me what happened. 
then most of the time tell you we reach the place where sure we really want to live. But we accepted graciously the idea that if God wants us to die, that's okay too. In other words, we're saying yes to everything. If you say yes for everything, then somehow you created a paradox. But when you create a paradox, you also create space, because when you move in two different directions, that's a paradox, in a way. But, it, but that's where the space for healing is created. And that's the beginning of a discussion on consciousness. I like the way in which you say the yes. Um, there is a grammatical form in Hebrew that's called the shafel. There are not too many uh, um, models around in classical Hebrew, but in modern Hebrew it's become strong again. So when I say uh, shach pale, you know, to you hear the word kafel double, the shach pale to duplicate. Hmm. Shikum and so on. So Shchina has the word Cain, hmm. and she's the one that makes you say yes. <laughs> she causes yesing in you. Hmm. What would you What would you say? I'm not sure I'm right about it. Probably I'm not grammatically, but you sura. Huh? Maybe at the maybe, which means to suffer. Basically, Vayar Hashem ki saw the growth. God saw that Moses turned to see. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe we suffer because we're turned away from the light. Mm -hmm. But I don't really think that that's the root. Well, I tell you, it doesn't matter. You know, in Rosh Bekabal Schad, the person who needs to hear it, when they hear it, um, Ramdas and Levine is his name. Yeah. Um, Stephen Levine. Stephen Levine. Stephen Levine. Yeah. We're talking about the issue. I, I had a... The um, VHS film that I would show to my students of a seminar that they had with with uh, people who were dying, and by the time the movie was made ready to show, some of the people had gone already, mm. and they were talking about going into the pain. What is it when you go and, and you go into the pain? Mm -hmm. And what a difference that that made, you know, that the pain of wanting to run away from the pain increases the pain and the pain of meeting it. I remember when you once said to me, it's not pain, it's just intense feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's <coughs> that there's a there's a difference between the attitude that we have. And I want to come back to the business of you know a way to say that the Rabbani Shalom is very poor and you know that we are we are, we are, we are doing something that we have to give parnosa to God that God has to have an income from us there's a lovely story the Bala told us Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Paul Noya uh, heard about the Baal Shem Tov, he had met him before when he had taken away his minion. The people who were about to come to Daven with him, he started to tell stories. So they didn't come to the Daven and so he had met him before. But then he didn't realize who he was and he came later on to Meshbish to find out about him. So he has a way of uh, teasing people, the Baal Shem Tov. Um, remember there were 18 years that he was hidden, living in the country, and you don't have a sense that he was having shiurim with any great Rosh Hashivas except with Achia Shaloni. Yeah. That a, uh, um, who is the Rebbe of Eliyahu Anovi coming to teach him. But other than that, we, he's, he's in the country. So, um, he says, you know, there is this guy, this Politz, and he's got four horses. And those horses are so wonderful. One is, flies like an eagle. The other one is strong as an ox. The other one is like a lion, you know. <laughs> and the one horse he has is like a man. She really knows the path and the way and so on and so forth. And Bala told us, who's so used that people will talk long this term and not about horses and so on and so forth, gets upset. He doesn't realize 
that the Baal Shem is talking about the Melkova, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the four horses and so on, that he doesn't get it. So he's about to leave, he's getting, getting upset. What did I come here for? So he is about to step into his wagon to go back when a guy comes over to him and says, Rabid, Shalom Aleichem Rabid, how are you? By this time he's so disgusted, he says, none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> he says, are you making a living? He says, what's it to you? <laughs> he says, uh, you live on six rubles. He gives him a time. You know, I don't know what six rubles or three rubles, I don't know what, what it was like per week. But what does the Rabbi sit on? You know, what's God's income? Tehillus Yisroel, Vata Kodesh Yeshev Tehillus God makes a living from us saying Baruch Hashem, you know? That's how God makes a living, that we give thanks in this way. Oh, then he went back to the Baal Shem and he, got an, and he became a Talmud. So that sense of saying, are we sustaining God, do we give Hashem a living this day, I think, that's an important thing, and I just want to make sure that, you know, we don't forget it in the mitzvahs that we do, that we're giving parnasa. Interesting thing, that the, there was a man, his name was the Piyasets Naremi, he wrote a book called The Eish Kodesh, just like this place is named after him. He um, had this very, I don't know, he was in a, in a very peculiar position, he was the last of the rabbis to say Torah and Shalashudas in the Warsaw Ghetto. And he would write down what he said and it was then found after the war hidden somewhere by a Polish worker. And anyway, they made a they made a book out of it. And he's gotta, you know, preach Judaism but he knows what's happening in places like Madonic and Auschwitz and what are you gonna say? So in one of his lessons he talks about uh, the Gemara. The Gemara, it's in Chagiga, and the Gemara says that uh, basically God cries, right? And then the Gemara questions that, but there can't be any crying by God, you know? After all, there's only Simcha. And then the Gemara answers, well, really, uh, we're talking about the inner chambers and the outer chambers, and the outer chambers there's Oz for Chedva Ben Komo, there's only strength and joy in that place, but in the inner chambers, there's tears. And he takes that position, and he quotes that command that God cries, and he says that sometimes people can be in such terrible positions in life that they look around them and there's just like an emptiness that they experience and they have to ask like where is God and how is he allowing these terrible things to happen and God himself is crying and a righteous person the only thing they can do is join God as he cries mm. and if they join God in his crying eventually things will open up for them. Now it's very curious because to be a sensitive Rebbe is a very big Talmud Chochem and he certainly was a Rebbe in the Kabbalah you got to understand that there are many Rishonim that hold that that Gemara is a toss sofa. It's what? It's a toss sofa. And yeah, really, wow. it's, it's, a, it's, it's a mistake. And then really, you can't say that God cries, bottom line. I mean, you know, you can say that God is upset because things are going wrong in the universe and he would have preferred them to go differently. But God is God. He's removed from the whole thing. This is also the position of the Zohar. And, ulti and ultimately, when the Ari explains it, he explains the uh, two places of Ozva, Chedva, and Komo, uh, where there's only joy and where there's tears. He still relates them to aspects of the Sviros, but not to the Atzmios of God, not to the actual essence of God. Whereas the Piyasetsna, knowing all of this, as he must have, nevertheless felt that the anthropomorphic image was extremely important to express at that time and, uh, and he just brought it across in a very simple way that God cries and we should be crying with him. So there's nothing wrong, he said there's a difference between 
emotionally relating to an image or philosophically holding strong that the image is the reality. And I think that there's going to be a difference. And that um, it, it, it comes like this, it's sort of, it, this is all reflected in, in, in the human consciousness. I have what you might call in me an I. And the I, this is, if you're a psychologist, you, you, you'll have a different language for this, but, but the I is an undifferentiated consciousness. Undifferentiated consciousness means I, I can think before there's anything to think about. I can hear before there's anything to be heard. I can speak before there's any words to say. Now, whenever I do anything, it's a manifestation of that undifferentiated consciousness, right? So I build a bridge, I fall in love, I eat bananas, whatever it is, right? <laughs> I do all of these things, but if you take them all and put them together, they don't begin to equal the I. In other words, it's like God. God says, Behold the places with me, Rashi Kamens, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Bekomo, Shalolo, Vienna, Olo, Bekomo. God is the place of the world, but the world is not his place. In English, we would say God is in the world, but he's not of the world. Uh, now this becomes a very, very, why do I push this point? Not only from a philosophical point of view, it becomes very important psychologically. What happens if a person really believes that he, the essence of his being, is one and the same as what he does? And if I do enough stuff wrong, and I think that's me, I have nothing to live for. But if I understand that every manifestation of my I is nothing more than a manifestation, but has nothing to do with the essential I, that's different. So if a person says to you, I want to kill myself. Well, wait a minute. The I wants to kill the self, because the self is not manifesting, it's manifesting the I in the way it should. Or if a person says, I am in pain, then the I is objective enough, <clears throat> objective enough to see that it is in pain. But, it's, but if I say, I am pain, you can't say that. Because if I was literally, in, if I was re literally the pain I'm experiencing, the first thing I wouldn't have is pain. I understand that. It would be like somebody born with pain and doesn't know it. So the objectivity that allows me to know I'm in pain proves that the pain is not me. Okay? And therefore the same with God. We are created in the image of God. There's an essential sense of being that has nothing whatsoever to do with any output of that being on one level and on another level couldn't be unless it was being supported from the from the right, from the yes. when it makes it get me yes. to be I want to go back to the business of the pain when I say I hurt you know I hurt it's different than I have pain yeah. mm -hmm. but the thing about anthropomorphism that needs to be paid attention to is it depends in which world we are I remember I had a conversation with Rabbi Dalvi Koenig around the world. There is a teaching about that when you count the spherot, sometimes you count dot, sometimes you count keter. So I asked him, Bezman, Shadat, how is that? So he said, Verstehst nicht allein? So he turned it back to me and says, Don't you understand yourself? So I said to him like this. In Atzilut and in Yetzirah, Haketa Nimna. In Briya and Nasir Hadas Nimna. He said, Gerecht. Now, I'm just going to unpack this a little bit. A lot. Uh, <laughs> a lot of you. So I was asking you before if you had here the English translation of the um, uh, Ein Yaakov. In the most editions of the Ein Yaakov, have a statement by the Bavon, the son of the Rambam, in which he says, every time you have these wonderful anthropomorphic things, you have to know that you must not reify them, okay? But then comes the other side of that. So why use them? What's reify? Reify, to make them think that they're real. Re 
reality. Res is a, is a Latin word meaning a thing. Reality is a, a, the thingification of something. Okay. Okay. And um, <laughs> so when you say this is real, it's thing-like. You know, you can touch it and so on. And so, forth. <laughs> so the question is, on which level are all these stories, all the images real? So there happens to be an interesting marshal that came from Franz Kafka. There was one guy saying to the other one, he says, Every time you, you use a parable, you know what the parable's good for? You say, go yonder, there's no place where you can go. So please, no more parables. He says, oh, if only you could get into the parable, all the parables would get true, would become true for you. The other guy says, I bet you that's only a parable. He says, you win the bet. <laughs> but he says, you win only in reality, in parable you lost. <laughs> okay? You win only in reality, in parable you lost. There is something about the Mashal HaKadmo, <coughs> there is something about going into the parable <coughs> where the parable becomes real. And that's where the root metaphors are. That's to say, the same when I say that you are a king and I'm your subject, then that's a root metaphor and out of that comes relationship. There was an article that came in the Yiddish Algemeiner uh, paper of an interview I had years and years and years ago with uh, Rabbi Berkowitz, William Berkowitz. So there I was saying out that the word chassid is a relationship word. It implies that you have a rebbe. If you don't have a rebbe, you can't say you're a chassid. You know, chassid is like atatn sakin, you know, you're a child of your father. There's a relationship. And everything that happens in relationship happens in this world of Yetzirah, which is a real world. How does God look in that world? <coughs> if you want to see God in the world of Yetzirah. So there's a malach that's called meta, Metatron, a Greek word, the one who sits over the throne. And it says that he looks like his, his boss. And you get the idea, all the anthropomorphic things, all the romances that we have with God, the stories that we have with God, they all have them in that world, and in that world they're real. There's a category error that if you take that world into the world of Bria, then it's a lie. So you need, in the, if you take it into the world of Asir, then Avram Avinah has to come and break the idols. But in the world of Yetzir, where the heart is, that's where you need that. So there were some people <coughs> at the even before, before the Zohar appeared, okay, let me be nice about that. And they were talking Kabbalology, that's to say they were talking about spirit and this and that and so on and so forth. Then comes the Zohar and tells a story, there's a king and there's a queen and there is, and all that, that stuff makes a, a, a romantic thing. Then comes the Bala Sulam and he makes Kabbalology out of it again, you know. <laughs> He takes away the romance and, and puts it back into system. So if you understand that there's a place where the romance is alive, and that's where Midrash is, where the language of the Zohar is, and that's where the Davenin is. Bo Ato is in that in that language. You know, Al Mishkove Balela is at my at night on my bed at night, Bikashti at Sha'ava Nafshi Bikatsi Velova Iti. I sought the one whom I love and I didn't see him. That's hard language. So that's why it is so uh, hard for some people to understand why did Nachman was saying, enough talk already, I've taught you so much, now let me tell you stories, right? Because in the stories there's something that opens up and our heart opens up. That's why I would call Rav Shloyman the the genius of virtuous reality, because he would tell us mices and he would touch our heart in that way. And I have a feeling that with all the stuff that happens in seminaries and in, uh, in teachings of Kabbalah and this and that, it all goes to the head and it doesn't engage the heart. 
And that's why I'm so happy about here, Eish Kodesh, the Dapen, and everything that happened. So the heart is engaged. If the heart is engaged, then God needs us. That's what I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's Rahman Alipa boy. That's right. <laughs> When you take it in shot, what happens? The Aztec cut out the heart of their victims, you know? I think that uh, getting back to Das, Kessa, the Ari, in his writing, he says, what's Das? Das is when Bina, which is the level of conception of the mind, expands and moves into the heart. When Bina is made manifest in the heart, when what I know I agree with in my heart, at that point I have Das. Because wherever the word Das is used, you have Chibur. Das mm -hmm. always means to connect. Uh, even though there's a Yerushalmi that says, Yemein Das Abdullah Menayim, and if you're not for Das, how can you tell the difference? And that's why we make the, uh, the uh, Saturday night, what's the Shabbos? We make the Havdalah right in the middle of the Brokha Vatachon and the Adam Das. Because of that Yerushalmi, you mean Das Havdalah Menayim. But it's really, not a, it's really not a contradiction, you see, because if you know a little bit of math, you realize that you can't really know distinction until you first know sameness, similarity. And so Das is basically to connect things, to show similarity. When the mind and the heart are of one accord, then the person has das. Now, at that point, a person always has unity also when the mind and heart are of one accord. And in Ahava, love is bigamatriya, it equals one. So, so love comes about when there's no friction between what I know and the life that I live, the kind of things that uh, I care about emotionally. There's, there's no question about that. Now, this this whole idea of, of you know of, of das and having it in the in this, this unification uh, of das, this this moves and moves so that the anthropomorphic image really is that which brings what is beyond my mind to comprehend to what it is within my grasp to, to comprehend it, it brings the unknowable and the, and the possibility of knowledge together. There's an anthropomorphic image that does that. And what's interesting about it is on all levels, like Rabbi Zalman is saying, on one level you have an image level or a uh, or a doing level, or a level of, of conscious awareness, or even a level of, of Ruach HaKodesh, you know. But, but what's interesting is, even though the image, which means the form at each level, changes, but the dynamic that projects the form remains the same. That's like saying somebody invents a wheel. Oh, wow, what can I do with this wheel? I suppose I can put it on my wagon and the wagon will move now, <laughs> right? So I got a wheel and then, you know, I got a windmill and then I got a wristwatch. And they look like they're different things that serve different functions and they're totally different forms. But you know what? They all only can work because of this thing that goes around this wheel. And so basically the, the inner aspect of any image, if the image is a true image, when you take that image to a higher level, the form of the image is going to change drastically, but the inner dynamic is going to remain the same. And I think that basically the common denominator or the inner dynamic between all things becomes the will of God. And therefore God is the common denominator behind all things. That's why I suppose there are no two things in existence that can't be compared, at least in some way, because they all bear the imprint of the unity from which they came. Okay? Uh, and the idea of serving God, in a way, is to rarefy, to peel away the forms at each level and become more and more aware of the inner dynamic that leads to a connection 
between myself and my thoughts and God. Amen. Amen. I think we're gonna sing and then we're gonna continue. the question, what, is our, what, what do we dream about as Jews? And I say, like, hey, Avram, like, hey, Yitzchak, like, hey, Yaakov. And there's sometimes when I ask myself, what business have I had lately with Avram, with Yitzchak, with Yitzchak, with Yaakov, with Salif, I feel I don't live with them. I don't feel I'm living with Moshe Rabbeinu. I don't feel I'm living with the Baal Shem, you know? I ask myself, who, who do I live with most of the time? So I see that in my, uh, in the garden, in the inner garden, that the inner garden is pretty empty. <coughs> Rav Nachman has such a beautiful, beautiful um, image about how you put a davenim together. And he says there is a master of the field, he goes out and he plucks a flower, and from one flower to another flower, he makes a wreath, and from the wreath, he makes a garland, and, and, and the thing comes together. And the first, when you say Baruch, the bit is saying, please, don't stop saying bit, you know? I still would like that you should say, keep on saying, but I have to go to the Ruch too. <laughs> so, so there is this urge that please don't forget me, don't, 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 don't leave me, and so on and so forth. So, there is a story, and that story is the romance. And if I had to say something about what's missing, there's a lot of Haskalah around, there's a lot of teaching around. More books on Kabbalah around today than books on how to make meat kosher. <laughs> because most of us already get the, mo the meat kikashat already frozen and so on and so forth. We don't do much with that. But there's so much up for the mind, plenty of stuff for the mind. What I'm missing is uh, hard stuff. And so, for instance, when I uh, retranslated the uh, Anim's Mirror, which is such an amazing art thing, you know, a person says, let me sing you beautiful things. I'm just a poor person. Tika shirat rosh necha, kashir yushal kol necha. Let my poor song be like if the Levites were singing the Beis Hamikdash for you. 
there's this sense of, of um, giving God a um, serenade. Mi'im kol moch malkeinu sofia. So I would sing Shuber Serenade, a melody, to 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 Mi'im kol moch. That sense of being able to say that I have my romance with Hashem. I have a story, and when I look at the Jewish story that used to have a culmination with Moshiach. And I don't know whether you've had a daydream about what it's going to be like when Mashiach comes for the whole world, what, what's it going to be like. There used to be a song, Was wird sein als Mashiach wird kommen? A party. <laughs> what are we going to eat at that party? We'll eat Sharabor and Leviathan. Shorabor Leviathan. Shorabor Leviathan, we will eat at that party. Who will sing to us at that party? David Hamelech. David Hamelech. David Hamelech mit sein Kiedel. Wird den Spiel mal schön Liedel. Auf dem Sudenju. Wer wird uns teure Sorgen auf der Zude? Moshe Rabbeinu, and we go on. And who's going to say Chochmes, Shloim HaMelech, and who will dance Miriam HaNavia? You see what happens? It's like filling out the dream. And I feel that one of the things why so much of our Yiddishkeit is anemic is that we haven't nurtured that dream. We haven't spelled help with that dream. When I look around in books that have been printed with sacred poetry, I find very little Jewish stuff there. I find Rumi, I find Kabir, I find, you know, all these, these people, uh, St. John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, Rainer Maria Rilke, I don't find enough Jewish stuff. And I, I hear it on the way over, we were listening to the Prairie Home Companion. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a guy doing some Hanukkah music. And when you look at the Hanukkah music, how it is, it's the dreidel, you know, and... and Lockers and dreidel. Huh? Lockers and dreidel. Yeah, there's very, there's very little there. And so very few people have really paid attention to the Yidid Nefesh and translation, the seed, and, and to the other things. So I want to read you a shtickle of Haleo in a translation so you can hear it because it touches that dream, okay? Are you ready? Okay. But, okay. Don't do it for us. Hashem, not only for us, but to your character give the glory for your kindness and your integrity. Let not the detractors mock us and say, where is your God? Our heavenly God does everything as he pleases. Those who get depressed over money and gold that they have forged with their hands, they have mouths that do not speak, they have eyes that fail to see, their ears hear no music. They're not able to enjoy good scent. Hands they have, and never really touching. Feet that get them nowhere. Throats that do not sing. Merely toiling, they are like robots, not trustworthy at all. But Israel, trusting God, finds help and protection in her. Aaron's house, trusting God, finds help and protection in him. And those who are awed by God and trusting God find help and protection in him. So now we say, Rebbeinu Shalom, be mindful of us, bless us, bless the house of Israel, bless the house of Aaron, <coughs> bless those awed by you, both the little with the big. Keep us and our children growing in blessing. And we, with the grace of God, who fashions heaven and earth, will all bless you. While heaven is God's heaven, earth is for the children of the soil. Being dead, we cannot celebrate, Yah, or being downcast or speechless. Yes, we will bless, Yah, in the now, as well in the long run. Celebrate. 
And I, I think that if you sometimes can put aside the, the sh uh, shigra, the, the, the uh, habit of having, uh, you know, you don't pay attention to what you're saying. So it's good sometimes to, to really hear uh, that you hear, hear what your mouth is saying. And that's a wonderful thing. Do tell us a, a, the story about the, about the, the guy, the hunchback. <laughs> 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 it's too long and I, I need to read it from somebody. Have you got the, the, the Sepur and Maisias around? If you want, I'll get it. Get it. Get it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What do I listen to? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Buat is on the I'll listen to every knock says, get it. It's, it's wonderful. Because, you see, <coughs> what happens is there's, there's this story. And all the, the scholars who have dealt with the story have said that um, the authentic version of the story is the Hebrew. And I argued against That's that. that. Cool. The, uh, the authentic version is the Yiddish. Because Reb Nachman used Yiddish words that are no longer in our vocabulary. Right. Even Reb Nossin, if you read the thing, yeah. doesn't pick up on every nuance of the Yiddish. You can't. Yeah. Bushmir and, 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 and he wrote the Hebrew. <laughs> and and Nachman and everything else. It's wonderful. So he, he says, I want to tell you a story. And he begins with the story of the seven beggars. And it goes like this. There was a king. I'll just lead on to that. Okay. There was a king, and this king had a son, and he was very much interested that his king, that his son should be king in his lifetime. He wants to have Nachas to see his, his son being a king. Now, not very many uh, kings ever had this Nachas of doing. So he, he was a bright guy, and he became king. And he got so interested in the mind and all the stuff of the mind that the people who needed to know how to run a house, how to run a state, how to even fight a war, they weren't around. And there was never a great upset at one point because nobody knew how to work there. And during that upset, two children were lost and they were finding themselves in the woods and they were looking for anyone to feed them because they were so hungry. As they're walking in, in the woods, a beggar comes and he says, Kindle here, I'll feed you. He gives him some bread and he's blind. And they want to find out how does, he, how does he get around when he is blind and all that stuff is happening. And, the say, and, and, he, and he, gives him, he gives him a blessing, they should be as blind as he. Yeah. <laughs> then goes another beggar and goes another beggar. Finally, there's the one beggar that's the hunchback. Mm -hmm. The third beggar, by the way, is my, my, my most loved one because of the story of the heart, uh, the heart of the spring. Yeah. And when you know, yeah. when you can hear that in that language, that, that uh, is the longing language, you know, and what you talk about, what does the Rupal need, you know? If there's to be time, there has to be someone going around picking up good points in the world, moments, moments of Godness, and give it to Hashem so there should be another day being created. So wonderful. <laughs> so the, the, the kids get married when they grow up, and the beggars make a big deal. They go and collect all kinds of stuff and food, and now they're sitting at the wedding, and they say, Oi, the first night of the wedding, they're saying, oh, if only that beggar that fed us at that time would come. And just as they're saying it, he's here saying, Mazel Tov Kindelach, and he starts telling him his story. Now, the fifth beggar happened to be someone who was on back. So I'll read it to you in Yiddish, <laughs> and as then I'll translate it. And every once in a while I'll stop, and I'll tell you what I think it might mean. <laughs> then fifth in Tov, the fifth day, they were also joyous meaning the two children. Aban zei zeh de mant in dem betel, vis eres geven a chote. And they remembered or reminded themselves about this beggar who was a hunchback. Zei haben zei gebengt, vi nemt menem a head dem dem betel dem chote. And they yearned very much, if only he was here, this beggar, the, the hunchback. Varnas ez oldo zain, 
For if he was here, we would be very joyous. In them come to the line. With that, he came in. Unzucht, ich bin da. And he says, I'm here. Ich bin gekommen zu euch auf der Kasten. I've come to you on your wedding day. When he is there, when you found him. When I say, you housed, and he kissed, and he fell upon them, and he hugged them, and he kissed them. And I to say, gesucht, and he said to them, Früher habe ich euch gebencht, dass ihr sollt sein, als ihr wie ich. At first, I blessed you that you should be as I. Punchback Heint, yeah. Heint schenk ich euch der Today I give you a wedding present, as ihr sollt sein, as ihr wie ich, that you should be as I am. Und ich bin gar kein Hülkenit, and I'm not really a hunchback at all. Other rabbit, to the contrary, ich habe so eine Plätzchen, I have such shoulders, but they sind in Buat Machsikis am Aruba, that they are little that can hold more than they should be able to contain or hold. Und ich habe darauf ein Haskoma, and I have an approbation about this. You notice that um, somehow they say, you know, nobody else doesn't say by any of the other beggars, that if he was here we would be really happy, but it comes to him and says, really happy. And they want him to appear, and as soon as they yearn for him, poof, there he is, he comes. What an amulet given ain't was mentioned have been sich verlinkt mit dem Sach. For once there was a talk where people were boasting about this thing. Itlach hat sich verlinkt, dass er hat die Sach von mir et macht sich aus dem Aruba. Each person there boasted that he had this thing of a little that could contain more than it should be able to hold. Hat man von einem gelacht. And about one of these people, everybody laughed at him. Und der Ibrika war sehr haben sich berühmt mit dem Sach von Biet Machrich in Samaruba, Zenen Jörgefellen. But the others who spoke and boasted about this thing that they had of a Biet Machrich in Samaruba, everybody appreciated. Aber mein Biet Machrich in Samaruba is größer von sie alle. But my ability of Biet Machrich in Samaruba is greater than them all. Warren Eine von Sei hat sich berühmt, da sein Moer is a Muet Machsich is a Maruba. For one of these people boasted that his mind is a little that contains more than it should be able to hold. Warren Eine trucked of sein Moer a law firm or of others mentioned, because he carries on his mind thousands and thousands of people. Mit Gors er hit Stachus, with everything they need, mit others er and hoggers, and all the ways in which they conduct their lives. Mit gozea havayas, mit zea tenuas, and everything that they need to exist, and every motion that they make, he carries all this in his mind. Through there does alts go of sein moer. He carries this all on his mind. Is er sich am wut, mach sich es am aruma. So he must be a little, his brain that is, must be a little, that holds much more than it should be able to contain. But in a shtickle moyer, so I've sich trogen as I feel mentioned, with God's air in stachus, because a little piece of mind should be brain. able to, or yeah. brain, should be able to hold so many people with all of their needs, etc., etc., right? The room has to be at Maxich is a maruba, therefore he should be called in other words, this little place, this little bit of mind that he has, carries all these people and everything they need. But men oisem gelacht, and they made fun of him. They didn't like this, what he said. <laughs> and they have sich dort ungerufen, and the people there called out, Du bist nicht, you're nothing. <laughs> und in deine Leid sind nicht, and the people that you carry around in your brain also are a bunch of nothing. Hat sich eine ungerufen, und hat gesucht, and one of them called out and said, Ich hab gesehen, als soy a Biet Machsich, as a Maruba. I actually once saw a Biet Machsich, as a Maruba, like, like you. What an amul bin ich vergangen, one time I passed by a mountain. Habich gesehen, se 
is oif den bar given zeya sach mist and tinov. And I saw that on this mountain there's a lot of garbage and excretion. Is by mirach inish given, and this was astonishing to me. From vanen kumt oif den bar gaz oif and mist and tinov. How did all this garbage and excretion get on this mountain? Is dot given a man shlebet den bar. And so <clears throat> there was a man near this mountain. Had the man gezucht, and this man said, "This is alls from me. This is all from me." But an heir is dot gezessen living the bag because he lived there, right near to this mountain. Had the alls give off and left the bag, missed and fat, and paskitzta from the zayin essen and drinking, and he kept on throwing garbage and excretion from his eating and his drinking onto this mountain. Is das von em azoi fil mist and tinev of den bag, and it's all from him. So much garbage and excretion on his mountain. Think of the pollution we create. This is so Nimsa, amazing. Nimsa yeah. comes out. Azich de men is zich de men shamir machlech is hamaruba. That this little guy who's near the mountain is like a person who carries so more than he should be able to contain. But if an aim mentions that as I from this time, because there should be so much garbage from one person, as I does uh, so to you that claim that you carry all these people. You understand, a lot of people didn't like Reb Nachman. Yeah. Reb Nachman was very outspoken in a certain sense. Um, he was like, you, you understand that the Baal Shem Tov had many students. They say that he had 60 primary students. Many of those students, most in fact, had children of their own sons. And uh, there was an agreement that no one of their children becomes a Rebbe. In other words, if one of them was a rabbi and he had a shul, a yeshiva, and the kid, and the kid was smart enough to take over, okay, took over his position as a Rosh Hashiva, but that's possible, but not as a Rebbe. A Rebbe in the sense that you're a vehicle through which God speaks. You have Ruach HaKodesh, people come to you and, and, and see you as an oracle of the Almighty. Oh, no, no, no. That kind of greatness is not inherited. As far as I know, I'm not sure absolutely, as far as I know, the first person not to do that, who primed his child to become a Rebbe after him was Reb Shneer Zalman of Liadi. And there's a certain book that's written by, it's got the letters of Reb Mendel Vitebsk and Reb Aron Kalisk, and they write him very nicely, with a lot of honor, but they criticize him very sharply. And they say to him, like, you're setting yourself up, you kid up like suicide. And it took us, it took us years to learn to sit at a table with dozens of eyes watching us and simply say the grace after meal and mean only for God. And your kid is going to be the next Rebbe and poof, he's going to be like that. Better have you, he had a very certain student, what was his name? The uh, Balantan. Yeah, better make him the Rebbe. Anyway, <coughs> the Balatanya didn't listen, and, from, and as soon as he made that move, then you had dozens and dozens of other Rebbe's that followed suit, and you had these dynasties. Yeah, the Midrash Rabbah says that uh, you also shouldn't do that. There's a whole mice in the Midrash Rabbah about Rabbi Yanni. Rabbi Yanni walks in the street one day and he meets up with this poor man who looks very wise, very saintly. And he says to himself, wow, I said, well, that'll be a privilege. He invites him home and he gives him food. It turns out this old man doesn't know anything, doesn't know how to make a bracha. And Rabbi Yanni is very upset with him. So finally comes time to bench. So he says to the man, you have to say the grace after meals. The guy says, I don't know the grace after meals. What should I say? So the piano says, just repeat after me. Like, thank God uh, who provided a dog like me with food. <laughs> so the man says to him, you know, it says, Torah Siva Lono Moshe, Marasha Lekihilas Yaakov. It's this Torah that Moses commanded, an inheritance to the congregation of Jacob. The Kehilas Yaakov, it says to the congregation of Jacob, all of Israel, below the Kehilas Yani. And not to, it turned out it was Elio and Novi. Anyway, so Reb Nachman already saw the sham. He saw that if we're going to promote, you know, like 
Dynastic. A dynasty, sooner or later you're going to produce people who are not really what you want them to be and they're going to mislead people. And this was his way of speaking out against them. Mm -hmm. You have Rebbe's who carry thousands of people. Hey Rebbe, what toilet paper should I buy? Which yeshiva should I go to? How, how should I? They asked the Rebbe everything. I understand Reb Nachman was very different. I know this guy actually made a PhD about this. But um, <laughs> about this, Reb Nachman was very strange. It's a terrible Kutamaran, and we know from the verbal things. If you came and asked Reb Nachman something, it's not that he wouldn't tell you, he would tell you what he thought. But he would always tell it to you in a way that you were left to make a decision. No he idea. didn't take the autonomy away right. from him. In other words, he said, if God doesn't take away choice, how can a Rebbe? Mm -hmm. understand? And that's almost exclusive to Rebbe Nachman. Like this, you come to Rebbe, tells you what to do, you do it. If you don't do it, you think you, you, you're double-crossing God, you know? So he, this is his way, probably has a lot of other things in mind as well, but this is his way of satirizing what's going on. And you have these Rebbe's that carry everybody on their head, and what they're doing is making, you know, carbon copies of themselves. And you're nothing, and they're nothing, and whatever you are, which is probably nothing, but you need to do this, is just, you know, made manifest in them to go along with it. That's what he seems so to be So we got to get to the guy who is the best of those uh, little that contains the lot. Go on. Okay, so we go. <laughs> Eina, now one second. Eina had gezug. Wait, wait, wait. Eina had zich berimt. Er had de zaak van mij het maftig is aan mijn roemer. Waar een er had een stikkel in de diepe. Somebody said that he has this meat maftig is aan mijn because he has a little, like a country. It doesn't mean literally a country, a little city. A domain. A domain. We say, git ois zeer as ach peris. And this place gives out a lot of fruit. The Nach Barachet Men, the Peters, was the Medina Gitais. Afterwards, we count up how much fruit this little piece of property gives out. That men as the Medina held gold with a zoyfil art, we for the Peters put out in front of them. And if you measure it, you see that there's no, not enough space in this piece of ground that produces this fruit to hold all the fruits that it produces. Luxembourg and the banks that are there. So go as I feel art in the Medina and the Tov, he feel the Pedas Badaf and Farnamen. There's not enough room in that little piece of land for all the room that the Pedas, the fruits, need to take up. Nimsa is as if the, as is, is if thus a meat machlech is a maruba. So it comes out that his little piece of ground there is a little bit that holds a whole lot. What he said pleased them. This is certainly a little bit that holds a whole lot. I'll talk about it in a bit, it's trying to be the next one. Eina hat gizug, and one says, Ba'ashat er is ein, er hat ein pardes. He has a little orchard. Zer avol, and a very special one, vose is dot dot pedes, and there are all kinds of fruits there. For in ahin zeyer fil mention in Sroros, so many people and nobility travel there. But it says zeyer ashen of pardes, because it's a very beautiful orchard. And when it comes to summertime, so many people travel there, and sororas, and nobility, to go walking in that little orchard. And some emes, and the truth is, is dot and them garden, that there in that garden, Go on it for hand and as I feel art, I says, or kill and halt and as I feel mention, there isn't enough place to hold all the people that are walking around in it. Is it thus a meat? No, it's a maruba. So this little orchard or garden is a small place that holds more than it should be able to contain. Disney World is such a Is there or is it a And this also pleased them. Now, what's the difference between the first two? I think that in the first case, He's talking about a little piece of land that gives out more fruit than it should be able to hold. You know, sometimes you get a teacher, for example, and he says something. 
And uh, he relates to what he says in a certain way. But the people listening do with it and become more as a result of it, then the teacher has room for it in his own self.